a motel clerk disappears, leaving behind a trail of blood. Investigators have their suspect, but without a victim, what can they charge him with? A shooting is reported, but investigators have no proof that it really occurred. Until they can sift fact from fiction, they haven't got a case. Is a missing sofa the key to a woman's disappearance? The prosecution can't rest until it can make sense of a series of odd clues. Murder is usually the most obvious of crimes. The victim's bodies mute witnesses to violence. But their silent testimony may go unheard when they disappear without a trace. Tennessee, a thriving southern city. Home of Beale Street, the Blues, and Elvis Presley. But in 1997, it played host to a deadly mystery. In the early morning hours of February 8th, a man arrived at a Memphis motel. He became concerned when calls to the front desk went unanswered. He went to check it out. Hello? The clerk Hello? appeared to be missing. Hello? He didn't see anyone in the lobby, but there was blood on the counter. The office security door was open, and Hello? he noticed more blood on the frame. Convinced something was wrong, he left and called police. When Memphis police arrived, they discovered blood outside the motel entrance. Smearing indicated something had been dragged across the pavement. They found more clues inside. While the office showed no sign of forced entry, the cash register was open and empty. But a purse lying undisturbed nearby caught their attention. They didn't believe a woman would willingly leave it behind. The wallet inside still contained money, as well as a checkbook, credit cards, and driver's license in the name of Ricky Ellsworth. Alerted by police, the motel manager arrived and confirmed that Ricky Ellsworth was the clerk on duty. She said Ricky lived nearby with her husband, Don, and two children. A trusted, reliable employee, she wasn't the sort to just leave in the middle of her shift. Circumstances of the crime suggested more than robbery. Police suspected the clerk had been abducted. As police processed the scene, other significant details began to emerge. The office security door was equipped with a keypad, but it was open and showed no sign of tampering. Either someone had known the code or the clerk had unlocked the door. To investigators, that suggested Ricky Ellsworth might have known her abductor. Although police had begun to suspect foul play, Nothing prepared them for what they found in an adjacent bathroom. There were signs of a desperate struggle and much more blood. The running sink contained a small flashlight and the toilet seat had been ripped from its hinges. Wet, blood-tinged sheets indicated someone had tried to clean the room. Not only had Ricky Ellsworth disappeared, but it now seemed she'd been seriously injured. Captain R.G. Moore, who led the crime scene unit, feared the worst. 
When we don't have a body and we don't know exactly what happened, we'd handle it just like it's going to be a homicide case. If we process the scene, we collect our blood sample, we collect all the evidence we can find from the scene, and just keep it until we see what we got. Investigators hoped the evidence would lead them to Ricky. A squad car brought the victim's husband, Don Ellsworth, to the motel. He said he and Ricky were happily married. He told police his wife was a kind person who worked with a Christian prison ministry in her spare time. Every Christmas, she baked pies for the prisoners. But Ellsworth said their marriage hadn't always been so tranquil. They'd once separated for two years, and she'd gotten involved with a man who assaulted her and went to prison for it. Ellsworth said the man's name was Michael Rimmer. After finishing at the scene, the investigators returned to the station to conduct a background check on Michael Rimmer. What they found in the files was chilling. Rimmer was a high school dropout with a history of drug problems and violence. In 1989, he was convicted of robbing and brutally assaulting Ricky Ellsworth. Details of Rimmer's previous assault on Ricky raised Detective Robert Shemwell's suspicions. His actions at that crime basically uh, mirrored what was happening here at the motel uh, with the cleaning up, our attempt to clean up the evidence. Um, we immediately began looking for Michael Rimmer. Meanwhile, detectives narrowed the time frame for Ricky's disappearance. They found a couple who had checked in with her at 1.15 a.m. But when two others tried to check out around 2.30, she wasn't there. Detectives located a witness who said he pulled into the motel at approximately 2.15, hoping to rent a room. but he saw a man with bloody knuckles behind the counter and left without registering. He also noticed a four-door maroon car backed up to the curb, its trunk and doors open. Based on his description, police put together a composite of the man at the motel. Using an identity kit, a collection of facial parts and features that can be assembled as needed, the suspect's face came together. It resembled Michael Rimmer. Detectives then asked the witness to look through an album of more than 50 mugshots, including Rimmer's. Their hopes were dashed when he couldn't positively identify Rimmer as the man with the bloody knuckles. Detectives learned from a coworker that Ricky had recently gotten a birthday card from a Michael in Mississippi. She took the card into the back office to read but became angry and threw it away. It, on, sir. it was becoming clear to detectives that if they wanted to find Ricky Ellsworth, they needed to find Michael Rimmer. They started at the auto repair shop where he worked. Nobody had seen him since Friday, the day before Ricky disappeared. He'd left his tools and paycheck behind. One more critical fact emerged. When we got to talking to the employees there, uh, this same maroon four-door vehicle was described as being Michael Rimmer's car. Um, so then we decided we need to track down and find out where Michael Rimmer got this four-door maroon vehicle. It wasn't registered to Rimmer. If it wasn't his, detectives wondered where he'd gotten it. His co-workers sent detectives to another friend of Rimmer's who told them that his own maroon four-door car had been stolen a month earlier shortly after he'd last seen Rimmer. After four days, Ricky Ellsworth was still missing, and so was Michael Rimmer. Hoping for a clue to his whereabouts, police questioned his brother. Richard Rimmer said he'd last seen Michael on the morning of February 9th, just hours after Ricky Ellsworth disappeared. Michael had seemed exhausted when he arrived in the maroon car around 9.30 a.m. 
he asked Richard if he knew how to remove a blood stain from the back seat. Then, Michael pulled a muddy shovel from the car and scraped mud from his boots. Richard also told police that Michael claimed Ricky bought the car for him. She had visited Rimmer in prison after he claimed he'd found God. And Richard knew the two had met after his release. But somewhere along the line, the friendship soured. By now, two weeks had passed, and still nobody had seen or heard from Ricky Ellsworth. Detectives had lost hope of finding her alive, and their prime suspect, Michael Rimmer, still eluded them. They would have to find him and the stolen car if they had any chance of proving murder. I issued a theft of property warrant um, on Michael Rimmer and indicated in that warrant that when he, he was located, or if that vehicle was located, that it was to be uh, held for the Memphis Homicide Unit and processed. Detectives got a promising lead from one of Rimmer's former cellmates. He said Rimmer spoke of killing Ricky and burying her in Mississippi after he got out of prison. Rimmer's former girlfriend told detectives of a wooded area called Plantation Point near Arca Butler Lake in Mississippi. It was 45 minutes from Memphis. She said Rimmer liked to go there. Detectives headed to Plantation Point. They combed the area on foot, but didn't find anything. Then they called in Blackwater divers from the Shelby County Search and Rescue Unit, specially trained to operate by touch in dark, murky black water. The divers searched the lake. They didn't find anything either. Detectives were thoroughly frustrated. They chased down every witness and lead, but were no closer to solving the case or finding Ricky Ellsworth or Michael Rimmer. Now, they'd run out of options. In Memphis, nearly a month had passed with no progress in the potential homicide case. In early March, detectives got a phone call from Johnson County, Indiana. A sheriff's deputy there had stopped a maroon car for speeding. When he ran a check on the license plate, he discovered the car was stolen and there was a warrant for the driver. Michael Rimmer, sought for crimes including robbery and possible murder, had been arrested during a routine traffic stop. Detectives flew to Indiana, prepared to finally question Rimmer and examine the car for evidence. After obtaining a warrant, Forensic investigators with the Johnson County Crime Unit searched the car. They hoped for solid evidence, but never expected to find what they did. Numerous receipts, uh, hotel receipts, pawn shop receipts, uh, restaurant receipts, um, showing Mike's every step from the day Ricky came up missing to his actual apprehension. Investigators tested the stained back seat for human blood. Results were positive. It was their first physical evidence to suggest a connection between Rimmer and the crime. Memphis detectives questioned Michael Rimmer over the next two days. He denied stealing the car or having anything to do with Ricky's disappearance. So far, all their evidence was circumstantial. Without Ricky's body, there was only one way to link Rimmer to her murder. The blood from the rear of the vehicle Michael Rimmer was occupying and the blood from the scene matched. Um, we had a problem though, we had to determine or show somehow that that blood was Ricky Ellsworth's blood. They had one chance, a reverse paternity DNA test which uses the combined DNA traits passed on from parents to determine the DNA characteristics of their children. Forensic scientists compared blood from Ricky's mother to samples from the crime scene and the maroon car. They matched. The test established a 16 million to one probability that blood from the car and motel came from an offspring of Ricky's mother. It was the final link police needed to prove murder. 
Michael Rimmer's guilt was written in blood. Based on evidence, police believe they know what happened on February 8th. Michael Rimmer drove to the motel sometime around 1.30 a.m., knowing Ricky Ellsworth would be alone. When he arrived, she let him into the office. There, Rimmer exploded into violence, attacking her, then wrapping her body in sheets. Afterward, he tried to clean the room, but gave up and left the sink running. Dragging Ricky to his car, Rimmer made his escape. Although her body was never found, police believe Ricky Ellsworth is buried somewhere near Arca Butler Lake. Michael Rimmer was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. While no body was ever found in the Rimmer case, police used blood evidence to prove murder. But in Cleveland, Ohio, police would have to build a case on even less. On Saturday, December 15, 1984, Cleveland police were called to the home of Ernestine Campbell. She reported that her brother, Henry, was missing, and she feared for his life because she'd heard he'd been shot and his body hidden in an alley. She told police she'd last seen Henry the night before when he'd left home for a nearby after-hour spot. Officers searched the alley, but didn't find a body. In fact, they didn't find any signs of foul play. They drove through the neighborhood, but didn't see anything unusual. There was no sign of Henry Campbell, and nothing to indicate a violent crime had occurred. Officers canvassed the area, talking to residents who might have seen or heard something the night before. One witness claimed she heard shots and saw men running near the club. Another recalled hearing shots, but couldn't provide any other details. Still others confirmed shots were fired, but nobody admitted seeing anything. Police were frustrated. They had reports of gunfire and a murder, but couldn't find the purported victim. Homicide detective John Qualey, the lead investigator, recalls the odd circumstances of the case. Well, usually we're called to the scene of a homicide where we have a victim laying on the street or in a house, but we have a victim. Uh, and a lot of times we'll be able to get the weapon used in uh, a crime. With this incident, we were, a murder was reported. We went to the scene. We didn't have a body. We couldn't find the body. We couldn't find any evidence of blood or we didn't have a weapon. It was kind of starting without anything to work with. Police needed more information, so they returned to the Campbell house. Ernestine gave them a picture of Henry and more details. She'd heard that some people claimed they'd seen Clarence Barnes shoot her brother in the back. She said Barnes ran the After Hours Club in his home and that there was bad blood between him and Henry. Hi, Miss Richardson, sorry. At the station, people who had been at the club that night began coming forward. A woman named Jacqueline Richardson told investigators she saw Campbell at the club and that he argued with Barnes. When Campbell left, Barnes, who had a gun, followed him outside. She said the two men were joined by a third and walked out of her sight. Shortly after that, 
a woman ran into the club screaming that there'd been a shooting and Henry Campbell was injured. The other first two, or was Richardson went outside where a passerby told her some men were chasing and shooting at another. She said she didn't see anything and returned to the club. Barnes was already there, asking everyone to leave. As the search continued for evidence of murder, Victor Santiago told police what he knew. He was the third man Jacqueline Richardson had described, and his account took up where hers left off. He said he'd seen the two men arguing outside the club and heard Barnes order Campbell to leave. According to Santiago, Campbell caught up with him a few moments later. As they walked down the street, he heard a shot and Campbell fell forward. Santiago said he took cover, then watched Barnes fire three more shots at the prostrate Campbell. Police now had two eyewitness accounts, but still no evidence of a homicide. Henry Campbell had disappeared, and detectives had two eyewitness accounts of murder, but no body and no evidence. Several residents claimed Clarence Barnes bragged that he'd burned Campbell's body and that nobody would ever find him. Investigators brought Barnes to the station for questioning. He admitted having words with Campbell and asking him to leave, but said he didn't know what happened after that. He denied having anything to do with Campbell's disappearance. When police asked Barnes what he did for a living, he told them he worked at the Animal Resource Center at a local university. That immediately rang a bell in Qualey's mind, and he called Barnes's supervisor. We asked him if he had a, um, an incinerator in the, the school, and he said, oh, yes, and he, we asked him how big it was. He said it was big enough to incinerate a steer. We told him then that we uh, were investigating a ho homicide and that possibly there may be human remains in the incinerator and asked him if he would seal the room. He did. The next morning, detectives and a team of forensic investigators went to the Animal Resource Center, believing they might find the remains of Henry Campbell. While the facility director arranged access to the incinerator, the security chief showed them surveillance video from the night Campbell disappeared. It showed Barnes arriving around 3.30 a.m. He backed into the receiving area, which was approximately 15 feet from the incinerator entrance. Police could see him carrying something toward the incinerator room, but couldn't identify what it was. The picture then jumped away and came back, and then the next picture was the incinerator door open and Clarence pushing a cart in there. You could not see what was on the cart, but we knew he was in the incinerator room at that hour. When investigators saw the incinerator, they knew they were in for a long, complicated task. Dr. Elizabeth Balraj, coroner of Cuyahoga County, recalls the challenge. And there were 100 gallons of cremated ashes uh, containing um, uh, the remains from various animals. And we had to sift through those and find a very small amount of human bones. If human bones were to be found at all. The team began the painstaking process of sifting through the incinerator contents. Using a fine mesh screen, they collected fragments of bone and other unburned debris. Though most of the fragments were tiny and charred, some appeared to be human, including a vertebra, mandible, and part of a pelvis. They also found a piece of melted lead. Its size and mass were consistent with a 38 caliber bullet. It was the first solid evidence of murder. Although investigators believed they'd found Henry Campbell, their case would go up in smoke if they couldn't prove it. They turned to Dr. C. Owen Lovejoy, 
a biological anthropologist at Kent State University and an expert at identifying altered or damaged remains. He applied his skills to making a positive identification from the incomplete and severely damaged bone fragments. Lovejoy concurred with Dr. Balraj that approximately 160 of the recovered bones were human. The next step was determining whether they came from one person and whether that person was Henry Campbell. The process would be complicated by their condition. Here, the pieces of the puzzle, all of the edges had been frayed, as you will, by the cremation process. And so none of the pieces fit together, and we had to look at them in an isolated state. After a thorough inventory of the fragments, Lovejoy determined that portions of an entire skeleton were present. No bones were duplicated. That told Lovejoy the remains came from a single individual. But was it Henry Campbell? Next, he would try to establish specifics about the individual. Investigators had recovered part of the pelvis, which is diagnostic for both sex and age. Lovejoy concluded the remains belonged to a male, approximately Henry Campbell's age. While detectives were closer to proving they'd found Campbell, they needed positive identification. But Lovejoy couldn't give them that, not without more to go on. Whenever we have a candidate individual that we believe the skeletal remains might match. What we do is we try to get a pre-mortem x-ray. Investigators delivered existing x-rays of Henry Campbell to Dr. Lovejoy. Could they help him prove murder? As Cleveland detectives sought to identify the bones found in the incinerator, Dr. Owen Lovejoy compared post-mortem x-rays and bone fragments with Campbell's radiographs. He focused on the skull, hand, and mandible. One recovered cranial fragment had a BB embedded in it. That matched an x-ray taken when Henry Campbell had accidentally been shot years earlier. Lovejoy also identified shared characteristics between Campbell's other x-rays and corresponding bone fragments but he found the most compelling correlations in the lower mandible, or jawbone. And the outline of that jaw, the details of the bone structure, and the details of the root areas where the, where the teeth had been prior to death, all uh, were configured in such a way that they indicated that this was a positive identification. Since the jaw figured so prominently in that identification, Dr. Elizabeth Robinson, the team's forensic odontologist, reviewed Lovejoy's conclusions. In her opinion, two significant findings bolstered his analysis. The end of the jawbone was flat, a unique defect present in Henry Campbell's jaw. A second anomaly, an area of intense calcification, clinched the identification. And it was in exactly the same area than it was on the post-mortem as on the antemortem. It was also only five millimeters in size. In other words, it's exact same size, same area, and on both x-rays. With the positive identification, investigators had literally pulled proof of a homicide from the ashes. On December 21st, less than one week after Henry Campbell was reported missing, Barnes was officially charged with murder. Based on the evidence, police believe Barnes followed Campbell from his after-hours club, shot him, then hid his body. Later that night, Barnes took Campbell's body to the Animal Resource Center, where he incinerated it. In April of 1985, Clarence Barnes pled guilty to the murder of Henry Campbell. He received 15 years to life for aggravated murder. In Cleveland, police had to sift their case from a pile of ashes. In Maryland, investigators followed a winding trail of clues to capture a killer. Rockville, Maryland, August 10, 1988. 17-year-old Kai Lau returned early from a California vacation at the behest of a family friend to check on his mother, Lisa Tu. He hadn't heard from her in nearly a month, and others told him they hadn't heard from her either. That wasn't like his mother. 
When he and his mother's friend found no sign of Lisa in the house, they contacted police. They went to the Special Investigations Office at the Montgomery County Police Department to report her missing. Detective Turner? Yes. Kai informed officers that nobody had seen or heard from his mother for a month. He said that his stepfather, Gregory II, might know more, but he was overseas on business and Kai didn't know how to reach him. Before Gregory left, he told friends that Lisa had flown to San Francisco to visit a friend in the hospital. Kai said it was unusual for his mother to go away without telling anyone except Gregory. Police promised to investigate. They began by contacting the airlines. Records confirmed that a one-way ticket had been purchased for LL2 on July 13th. The destination was San Francisco via a connecting flight in Los Angeles. The ticket to Los Angeles had been used, but not the one for San Francisco. It appeared Lisa, too, wasn't planning to come back. This is the one the that was her right, this is the one but the detectives that. needed to make one more call. They contacted the friend Lisa was supposed to be visiting in San Francisco. She said she hadn't been in the hospital, wasn't expecting Lisa, and hadn't yeah. talked to her in months. Now, detectives began to consider whether Lisa, too, intended to disappear, or if there might be a more sinister explanation. Detective Roger Thompson worked the case. It was not the normal missing person case where we, we know somebody's missing for a particular reason. They may not contact family members, but we sooner or later find them. This had some um, some mystery to it. To find out more, detectives spoke to several of Lisa's friends and learned the twos had been married nearly 10 years. It was the second marriage for both, and Kai Lau was Lisa's son from her previous marriage. The twos had enjoyed the good life. Gregory was a successful restaurateur. In fact, one of his restaurants had been a favorite of Washington's elite. But it hadn't lasted. He'd suffered business reversals and lost his restaurants. A commissioned sales job couldn't support the family's affluent lifestyle. Gregory and Lisa argued about money, and their marriage was rocky. Police also learned that Lisa was romantically involved with another man. Police questioned him at his office. He said he spoke to Lisa the afternoon of July 14th, the last day anyone saw or heard from her. He denied knowing anything about a trip to San Francisco and expressed concern over Lisa's sudden disappearance. He indicated Lisa's husband was suspicious about their relationship. When he passed a polygraph test, investigators believed he was telling the truth. Detectives checked out the family's finances and saw indications of serious problems. Gregory was $30,000 in debt. Detective Mike Turner realized two was under a lot of pressure. Gregory was uh, known to like to gamble. And we determined that he, through interviews with friends, had accrued some debt in gambling that he had not been able to pay. And this was another problem that uh, arose uh, with his relationship with Lisa. Detectives also learned Lisa Tu's bank and charge accounts had been inactive since early July. That didn't make sense if she was alive. They discovered that her husband who was still unreachable on a business trip, would collect a $200,000 life insurance policy if anything happened to his wife. Detectives began to suspect that the couple's financial woes might spell more than a simple missing persons case. As the investigation continued, Lisa's son was doing a little detective work of his own. 
Kai Lao found his mother's address book in her bedroom. That was odd because she seldom went anywhere without it. He also noticed that furniture in the house was missing or rearranged. He called Detective Turner. Hi, Detective Turner. Kai returned to the police station and met with investigators. He had found that $44,000 had been withdrawn from a bank account Lisa kept for his education. And that wasn't all. Kai told police his stepfather's gun was missing and a sleep sofa had disappeared. He said his mother often slept on it when she and Gregory weren't getting along. Kai also informed detectives that his stepfather, Gregory, was due back from his business trip that evening. By now, investigators had a lot of questions for Gregory, too. They met him at the airport and brought him to the police station. He was concerned about his wife and was eager to help police. He told them he bought Lisa a plane ticket to San Francisco so she could visit a friend in the hospital. He said he drove her to Dulles International Airport the next day and watched her board the plane. You wouldn't lie to us, would you, Mr. Two? Absolutely not. He claimed she called from Los Angeles and said she was awaiting the flight to San Francisco. He hadn't heard from her since. When they told him Lisa's friend wasn't sick and wasn't expecting her, he seemed surprised. Then he offered another explanation. He claimed his wife was unhappy with her appearance and wanted plastic surgery. He said they'd argued about it in the past. He surmised that might have been the real reason for the trip. Lisa probably made up the story of a sick friend, realizing he wouldn't buy the ticket if he'd known the truth. When detectives inquired about the missing sofa, Two said it was infested with mice, and he had it hauled away. He also said he threw the gun away after a well-publicized local incident where a homeowner shot some trespassers. He explained away the $30,000 debt as business and travel expenses. Two begged off further questions, saying he was tired from his long trip. Detectives agreed to continue the interview another day if two would take a polygraph test. He agreed and promised to return the following Monday. Gregory, too, didn't keep his appointment. He skipped town. To detectives, that seemed the act of a guilty man. We then felt that the suspicions that the family had that we had put together uh, since the initiation of the investigation now had come to fruition and we were looking probably at a homicide. Their suspicions about Gregory II grew even more when Kai brought them an Air Express letter from California. In it, Gregory claimed he was in Los Angeles looking for Lisa. If he didn't find her there, he planned to continue his search in San Francisco. Investigators considered the letter a self-serving excuse from a guilty man. But believing and proving are two different things. Without Lisa's body, there was no evidence she was dead. They began looking for proof in Gregory's story. Investigators followed up on Kai's tip about his missing college money and enlisted the help of the state's attorney's office. John McCarthy, deputy state attorney in Montgomery County, found Lisa had controlled it. Gregory too cleaned out that account. We got bank photographs from the bank and you, clear as day you could see Gregory too stealing the $44,000 from that fund. And within a period of 10 days after he stole it, he had run through that money. It was gone. Detective Turner re-examined the airline ticket to San Francisco. They learned it was possible for someone to check in, have the ticket marked, but not board the plane. He suspected Gregory, too, had done that and that Lisa never boarded the plane. 
they contacted passengers who'd been on the flight. Then, Attorney McCarthy got a real break. A woman called to say she'd been on the plane with her husband and small child. While airborne, the couple took several photographs. She says, well, I've got some pictures of the seat that Lisa, too, was supposed to be in on that plane from uh, Washington to uh, San Francisco, and uh, she's not in those pictures. And she forwarded to me those pictures, and uh, one of the ways we were able to prove conclusively that Lisa was not on that plane that Gregory said she was on was with the, those pictures. Detectives wanted to know more about the missing sofa sleeper. They wondered if Lisa's body was inside it when it was hauled away. They tracked down the men who picked it up. They remembered the couch because Gregory tipped them for carrying it out to the truck. They didn't notice anything unusual about it. Investigators traced it to the landfill, but that was a dead end. The sofa had already been ground up and buried. Detectives reasoned that Gregory might have gotten rid of the sofa because it contained proof of Lisa's death. If that were true, there could be other evidence at the residence. They obtained a search warrant to find out. An examination of Gregory's car uncovered incriminating evidence. Clumps of mud, weeds, and twigs were stuck in the undercarriage, indicating the car had been driven off-road. In the trunk, they found a plastic tarp, a carving knife, and a machete. Mike, come on over here. Look. All of the items were clean, but they could have been used to dispose of a body. Inside the house, detectives found their first physical evidence of foul play. There were droplets of blood on a chair near the spot where the sofa had stood. But investigators suspected more might have been cleaned up. To find out, they processed the area with a luma light, which makes blood that cannot be seen with the naked eye glow. They discovered blood spatters where the sofa had been, and it displayed a significant pattern. We know that the couch was open at the time when this all occurred because there was no blood swiping or markings underneath the couch. It was a fold away, open up couch, and when they put out the processing, you could see, basically see, the outline of the couch opened up as a bed. Investigators also found signs of smearing, evidence someone had tried to clean up the blood. While they were processing the scene, the phone rang. A car rental agency in Las Vegas was calling for Gregory II. Yes. The car he rented several days before was overdue. It was the break police were looking for. Now they finally knew where two was, but they needed some help in capturing him. What I would like you to do is, if he calls in about the car in the next few days, or brings the car in, try to stall him, or if he calls in, tell him that you would like to replace the car with another car because this one needs reservice or whatever reason you can think of, or it's going to be resold but somehow get him to come to the rental office to get another car. Hello, my name's Greg. The plan worked. On Saturday, September 10th, he arrived at the car rental office. Yes, your car is ready. It is? Police arrested him on a fugitive warrant nearly a month after he disappeared. Detectives Turner and Thompson flew to Las Vegas, where they began retracing Two's activities since he fled Maryland. A matchbook in his hotel room led them to a Chinese restaurant. The manager recognized Two from a photograph. She told investigators he had applied for a job, saying his wife was dead and he wanted to start a new life. On the job application, he gave his name as Greg Sen. 
When the detectives returned home with two, they called in a document examiner at the Maryland State Police Crime Lab. They knew Gregory had used aliases. They wanted to confirm whether the handwriting on the job application and other items he wrote matched the bank slip closing Kai Lau's college account. The stolen money would provide the motive for the more serious crime of suspected homicide. After providing known samples of Tu's writing, detectives awaited the results of the document examination. The job application, bank slip, and other documents were compared against Tu's handwriting. In making the comparison, factors such as writing style, speed, and pressure are all studied. Document examiner David Sexton explains. And it's a combination of those characteristics as well as a combination of recognizable letter formations and that combination of characteristics that are uh, unique to, to the individual's handwriting. The writing on the job application, bank slip, and other documents was Gregory Tews. Hi, how are you? Police also consulted a forensic serology investigator about the blood spatters found at the Tew house. He confirmed they were consistent with a high-velocity wound, most likely from a gunshot. Despite all the evidence investigators had collected, their case was still flawed. They needed something solid to prove murder. Without Lisa's body, the only physical evidence they had was blood from the house. They had to somehow tie it to the victim. They had only one chance and it was a long shot. To prove Lisa too had been murdered, Maryland investigators had to link her to the blood in the house. They hoped forensic DNA analysis could do that, but in 1988, it was still in its infancy. In fact, DNA evidence had only been used in a few trials nationally, none of them murder cases. And the two case posed a significant challenge there were no known samples of Lisa Tu's DNA that could be used for comparison. Without them, it would be difficult to connect Lisa with the blood spatter. The DNA lab needed to perform a reverse paternity test, but this time they would have to work backward. They would determine Lisa's DNA from the blood of her son. Because Kai Lau was a genetic combination of both his parents, scientists could, in theory, forensically subtract his father's DNA from his blood. What remained would be Lisa's DNA profile. Blood was drawn from Kai Lau and from his father in Hong Kong for comparison. By process of elimination, the lab confirmed, with 98 to 99 percent accuracy, that blood found at the two house was Lisa. With forensic DNA testing, detectives were able to prove homicide. Investigators believe Gregory too was moved to murder by jealousy over his wife's affair and the prospect of solving his financial problems with her life insurance. They pieced together a likely scenario for the night of July 14th. There were indications that the couple had argued, perhaps over the affair perhaps about money. Desperate and enraged, Gregory too pulled his gun from the cabinet and shot Lisa. He then disposed of her body. Despite his protestations of innocence, Gregory too was convicted of first-degree murder on November 21, 1989. He is currently serving a life sentence. Lisa Tu's body has never been found. Once, police had no chance of proving murder without a body. But today, they can make a case on forensic science, even when the victim has disappeared without a trace. Police in Connecticut begin to suspect a missing woman was murdered. But how can they prove it? when they haven't got the body.
After a 14-year search, a skeleton is found in a well. Is there enough left to determine what happened? A homicide investigation stalls until a dead man helps solve the mystery of his son's disappearance. Hiding the victim used to be the key to getting away with murder, but no longer. Even without a body, forensics can tear the fabric of lies and expose the bodies of evidence. A dead body, it's usually the first clue in a homicide. But without a victim, how can police catch the killer? Without a victim, how can they prove a murder occurred at all? In December 1986, Connecticut State Police were faced with just such a challenge. Hella Crafts, a 38-year-old flight attendant, had disappeared from her home in quiet Newtown, Connecticut. She left behind her husband Richard and three children. Her disappearance came as no surprise to Richard. Hella had recently filed for divorce after discovering he was having an affair. The Kraft's nanny, Marie Thomas, was worried. Her suspicions grew when she noticed stains on the carpet near Hella's side of the bed. She called Hella's best friend, who in turn contacted Hella's lawyer. According to state police detective Joseph DeStefano, Hella may have feared for her life. Hella explained to her attorney that if for some reason she disappeared or wasn't around any longer or something wasn't right and not to take it as being a coincidence that there was something wrong and she had asked her attorney please look into it that is exactly what had happened how he did disappear police questioned richard Krabs. though they knew his situation with hella was rocky he seemed an unlikely suspect besides his day job as a commercial airline pilot richard was a town constable sworn to uphold the law but as state investigators talked to Hella's friends, suspicions about Richard began to grow. When people were asking Richard where Helly was, he gave several different answers. At one point, he said she was visiting her mother. At another point, I believe he said she was visiting her sister. At another point, he said he didn't know where she was. Things that weren't consistent with what a husband would say if his wife was missing. That in itself, created some suspicion. Police had enough information to obtain a search warrant of Kraft's house, but not enough to charge Richard with any crime. They still didn't know if this was a criminal investigation or a wild goose chase. At this point in time, we had no answers. All we had were questions. They hoped to find some answers in the Kraft's bedroom. By the time they obtained the warrant, the room was virtually empty, apparently to get ready for new carpeting, but perhaps also to disrupt the crime scene. Meanwhile, Richard was on his way to Florida for Christmas and miles ahead of the police. Something happened here, but had the suspect erased all the evidence? Some of the furniture was discovered in the basement before investigators could examine the bedroom, they called in a friend of Hella's to tell them how it was arranged. After the room was back in order, the forensics team found stains on one side of the mattress. Blood spatter expert Henry Lee was called in to interpret them. The first time 
when you hit somebody, usually don't produce spatter. You only can create a wound. When the blood star deposit around the injury area, from the capillary or the vein, now you have poor blood. The second time you hit it, then you have spatter. Lee was able to determine from the size and distance the stain spread on the mattress that the blood spattered at medium velocity. That told him a little about the weapon. We know it's some blunt object, but I cannot tell you that's a hammer, an axe, or a flashlight. Could be any type of this blunt object. One thing Lee and investigators concurred on, they had found the crime scene, and it suggested bloody murder. A faint pattern of blood on Hella and Richard Kraft's mattress was enough to turn up the heat on what was, until then, a missing persons investigation. Now, police felt that Hella might be dead and that Richard Kraft's had killed her. But the proof was scant, shaky. They were relying more on instinct than evidence. If Mrs. Kraft's was killed, where was her body? They'd have to do their homework. The next level of the investigation was a review of paperwork that we had found in Mr. Kraft's background, particularly his credit card receipts. On the roster of routine purchases, one line stood out. We found that Richard Kraft had rented a wood chipper from the Darien Rental Agency in Darien, Connecticut. Though it seemed like a shot in the dark, De Stefano's sergeant suggested that perhaps Kraft's used a wood chipper to eliminate the body. De Stefano was skeptical. My immediate thought was things like that don't happen. They happen on television, but they don't happen in real life. He went to Darien Rental to see if it was even possible to use a wood chipper to dispose of a body. The rental agent showed him the chipper that Richard Kraft's rented on November 18th around the same date Hella Crafts disappeared. Okay, essentially what we have then, we've got all the material being fed in through this end. Right. And it's coming in contact with the cutters on the wheel over here. Yeah, which is spinning. Now, about how thick is that wheel? About, about two, two inches? inches? yes, sir. And that's solid steel. Yeah, it weighs about 900 pounds. 900 pounds. Those blades, one on either side. So once that, once that wheel gets moving, nothing stops it. No, not at all. The only thing that happens is whatever hits that gets cut. Yeah, you could throw a piece of steel in there, it wouldn't make any difference. It would cut it up. You say that opens up about 12 inches? About 12 right inches, yeah. So 1,200 RPMs with a 900 pound uh, piece of metal, two 12 inch blades. No way anything's going to stop that. Not at all. Though the massive blade could make short work of anything in its path, the hopper could only accommodate objects up to a foot wide. It would be impractical to dispose of a body that way, but not impossible. It seemed far-fetched. But while De Stefano was investigating the wood chipper, other detectives spoke with town workers to see if anyone had seen anything that might resemble a clue. A utility worker reported he was out in the early morning of November 19th. He saw someone operating what looked to be a wood chipper on River Road, adjacent to the Housatonic River. That chance observation propelled an otherwise stalled investigation. Attention shifted to River Road. When the investigators got to that location, they did in fact find wood chips on the ground. And exploring the area all the more, they found uh, envelopes with Helicraft's return address on them. At this point in time, we had the feeling that we've got something here that's, that's totally out of the ordinary. Investigators gathered 33 bags of debris from the River Road area. The bags were sent to the police station to be poured over piece by piece. Anything that wasn't a wood chip or a leaf was set aside. At first we would find one hair and not knowing what to do with it, we took a bottle and we began, we put the one hair in the bottle. We would continue on, we'd find an object that was harder than wood but softer than stone. 
So we felt that we'll start another bottle for items such as these. Out of the mulch, a grisly scenario was taking shape. Based on these initial findings, a tent was set up to process evidence on site. Constantine Karazoulis, the state's chief forensic odontologist, or dental expert, was called in in hopes of locating human dental remains. We would collect evidence and bring it into a tent, and we would put it through some water, through a filter, and look for things that were human, human parts. Circumstantial evidence was piling up. The blood in the bedroom, the wood chipper rental, the unidentified fragments in the wood chips. But there was still no body. And without a body, there was no crime. They needed to find something more definite. Investigators knew they had to turn the case around or a killer would walk. While evidence of a crime was turning up along River Road, police continued interviewing potential witnesses. One spotted a man with a wood chipper on November 19th on a bridge about a mile south of the River Road site. Divers were sent to the bridge to see what they could recover. The water under a bridge is the repository of all things broken and discarded. It's a dumping ground for vandals and a place where unwanted possessions are tossed and forgotten. Most are mundane, but sometimes the unexpected turns up. Dan Lewis was one of the divers. And what we were looking for was anything that could have been used as a weapon. We were looking for anything that, any type of a container, and certainly any more uh, body fragments. Underneath this bridge, there's many parking meters, road signs, shopping carts, the usual kind of things that you'll find discarded off of a bridge. I mean, something like a chainsaw or a type of weapon will be totally out of place. When they came up with that, you know, we immediately knew that uh, you know, we may have something here that pertained to that case. Like everything else in this case, the chainsaw's connection was tenuous. The tool was sent to Dr. Lee's lab to see if a link could be made. Meanwhile, a mile north at the tent, Detective DeStefano was making a gruesome discovery of his own. I had just put some debris into the screen. I had rinsed it off, and my normal course was after I would rinse, I would go through it with my fingers just to make sure that it was totally rinsed. As I was going through, you develop a certain feel for what you're dealing with, and wood chips have a, have a certain consistency about them. As I went through, I felt something that didn't feel like a wood chip. It felt slippery. And when I held it under the light, I found it to be the tip of a finger. The evidence of the crime was becoming ever more apparent, but it still wasn't strong enough to prove Hella's murder or to name her killer the pieces would start to come together in Lee's lab as the chainsaw was studied. The chainsaw deposit in the river must have a reason. We initially don't know what's the significance and the linkage, but by examining the chainsaw, we found tiny fragment of hair. Under a higher power magnification, microscopic examination, we made a determination that's human. Not only human, we noticed this hair was bleached and dyed. To Lee's assistant, Elaine Pagliaro, the bleached and dyed hairs were all too familiar. Over 2,000 of them had already been recovered from the wood chips and examined. The roots were of something we call paintbrush type. This paintbrush appearance to a root is characteristically found when hair is in tissue, and then that tissue starts to putrefy, and the chemicals from the putrefaction affect the appearance of the hair root. So it ends up looking just like a paintbrush. That's important in an investigation such as the Crafts case, 
because it indicates that the hair was in tissue and wasn't from a beauty parlor and dumped alongside the, the road. The hairs were then compared to hair from the victim's hairbrush recovered from the Kraft's house. They matched. The chainsaw was then taken apart. Inside the housing were blue-green cloth fibers and remnants of flesh and blood. The fibers were the same color and fabric as Hella's nightclothes. The flesh in the chainsaw proved to be human, and the blood type matched Hella Crafts. Now it was a matter of finding out who the chainsaw belonged to. The serial number was corroded from being underwater, but Elaine Pagliaro was able to restore it. Because of the nature of the way metal is formed, the impression goes through several layers. So even if you scrape off the top layer, if you take away that scraped portion, you should be able to raise up the impressed areas below. She applied a chemical to the surface of the plate, which dissolved the corroded layers of metal, revealing the serial number. The number is E. Five nine two one six one six. All my career, I remember that number. The serial number was traced back to the dealership. The chainsaw had been purchased by Richard Crafts. The forensics on the chainsaw potentially linked victim and killer, but investigators still had to prove that Hella Crafts was truly dead. After combing the banks of the River Road site for more than a week, Dr. Karazoulis found the final piece of the puzzle. And as I looked down, I noticed there was an object. And that object turned out to be a human tooth. In forensics, this is the Holy Grail. I knew I had everything that I would need to make an identification of a human being. A comparison with dental records proved the tooth belonged to Hella Crafts. But it suggested more than that. Part of the jawbone was still clinging to the tooth, and part of the root was cut off. If this tooth were just removed, you wouldn't see this type of a fracture, or you wouldn't see bone attached to it in this way. So I believe that some, some force broke this tooth from its seat in the jaw and crushed whatever it was holding to pieces. That force could have been a chainsaw or a wood chipper. Richard Crafts could be connected to both objects, and now indisputably to the victim, his wife, Ella Crafts the circle was closing in on the airline pilot. The condition of the tooth, coupled with the hair and skin evidence, was enough to allow the medical examiner to declare Hella Crafts dead, two months after she disappeared. Based on the trail of evidence, police reconstructed the likely scenario of Hella Crafts' death. On the night of November 18th, Hella was preparing for bed when Richard struck her with a blunt object. He got rid of the bloody sheets, but left telltale stains on the mattress and carpet. He had already rented the wood chipper, probably for some legitimate purpose. Then he realized he had the opportunity to kill his wife and used the chipper to dispose of her body. But he knew the opening in the machine wasn't wide enough to fit a human torso. That's where the chainsaw came in. This isn't something that you would do to an animal. It's just not something that, that you do. I mean, it's totally beyond the realm of what people do to each other. 
only six ounces of material from Helicraft's remains was ever recovered. Less than one one thousandth of a human body. But it was enough for the police to make their case. Most people don't realize two things. Number one, the lengths to which the police will go to investigate a crime. And number two, the power of forensics. Um, they don't realize the new developments that have happened within the past few years that have revolutionized forensics in, uh, in criminal investigation. It's, it's incredible what can be done now when you blend science with investigation. For his crime, Richard Krafts received a 50-year sentence. His unconventional way of disposing of the body proved to be his undoing, though it took a battery of forensics experts to prove it. But not everyone has access to those resources. One woman's desperate search for her sister would consume 14 years of her life. Ava Dehart was looking for a good time, but she fell in with a bad crowd. Her circle of friends was a motley group of biker wannabes, a touch of menace in the otherwise sleepy riverside town of Fredericksburg, Virginia in 1982. They hung out at a place called the Joker's Wild, a loose-knit gang with too much time on their hands. Ava's boyfriend was the leader of the group. His name was George Pasalis, but he called himself George Sparta. He was a man who was more feared than respected. Ava had dated him for eight years. During that time, their relationship grew more abusive. Occasionally, she'd leave him, but never for long. On July 20th, 1982, Ava left her house to go to work at the Joker's Wild. That was the last anyone ever saw of her. After a day had gone by with no sign of Ava, her family contacted the Stafford County Sheriff's Department. Detective Billy Bowler explains the investigation. When the investigation was first uh, initiated, it was a missing persons report. Um, and our sheriff at the time was uh, chief of detectives and picked up the case. He followed through with, um, interviewed the family. He went to interview Pat Solis. Pat Solis produces a handwritten letter uh, that was confirmed through family members that it was in her handwriting. More or less a Dear John type letter, I'm leaving, they had a spat. Uh, see you later, that kind of thing. I'm not coming back. If George knew where Ava had gone, he wasn't telling. Neither was anyone else. With no leads and no clear signs of foul play, the sheriff's investigation could go no further. I think Pat Salas, of course, was targeted as a suspect or an individual responsible uh, right from Jump Street, but they could, they, they had no one coming forward with any information. There was no uh, we had no body, we had no forensic evidence, we had no Ava Dehart. And Ava's family had no consolation. Ava's sister Debbie suspected a conspiracy of silence among the gang at the Joker's Wild. She felt the police weren't taking the case seriously. She knew that if Ava was to be found, she'd have to go it alone. The attitude was a bit hard to deal with in the beginning because I would take them uh, a rumor that I heard or someone that said something and and um, they would contact me again and tell me they'd followed up on it and and then we'd go through this cycle this whole roller coaster emotional roller coaster of going to them and giving them information and then having nothing come of it and it was very difficult to deal with Debbie was relentless in her pursuit of the truth Desperate to find her little sister, she bulldogged every member of the Joker's Wild Gang, pumping them for information, taking copious notes. She knew her only hope lay with the surly gang of bikers who said they were Ava's friends. But no one would talk. They were all afraid of George Patsalis. The weeks unfolded into years, but Debbie endured even though she was forced to realize her sister was probably dead. 
My friends say that when I get resolve on an issue that I don't let go. And I guess I'd wavered in my own heart and mind um, many times about what I always knew that she was dead, but I'd wavered in my own mind about what could have happened. In 1996, a news story caught Debbie's eye, a story about a woman in a footlocker. Her remains were found in Frederick, Maryland in 1982, the same year that Ava disappeared. Identification techniques weren't as sophisticated then. The body had been misidentified, and the new identification was a, a young girl, 22 to 26, the right height, the right weight. Um, she was found within four weeks of my sister's disappearance and had been missing approximately, been in the trunk approximately for four to six weeks. And so I just really uh, had a very emotional response to that. The search for her sister would lead her to the largest collection of anatomical remains in the United States. In April 1996, renowned forensic authority Doug Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington applied his expertise to putting a face on the lady in the trunk. Well, that was then printed in the papers, and it turned out that Debbie DeHart, the sister of Ava DeHart, happened to see that in the, in the newspapers, and she thought, could that possibly be Ava, because Ava had disappeared in 1982. Encouraged by the preliminary description of the lady in the trunk, Debbie acquired Ava's dental records so Owsley could compare them. But sadly, the dental work didn't match. The lady in the trunk was not Ava Dehart. Debbie Dehart's quest showed no sign of ending, but the lady in the trunk provided some unexpected help after all. There was so much publicity surrounding it. There were TV people and, and media people pursuing me, and I did some interviews. And as a result of that, I started to get phone calls. People were interested again. And I got some anonymous calls, people with little bits and pieces of information, but information I had needed all along. After 14 years of pushing, Debbie finally felt like she was making progress. She knew this could be her last chance. She hired private investigator Al Baker to help her follow up with the former members of the Joker's Wild Gang. We began uh, making contact with various people, which De Debbie was able to provide us with the names. She, she had done that thorough job as to know who was uh, part of this group, uh, how we could contact most of them. Nobody knew anything definite. Many were still afraid of George Patsalis. But one name kept coming up, Barbara Campfield the woman who became Patsala's girlfriend after Ava and who eventually married him. One woman in particular said she helped Campfield clean up some blood at the Joker's Wild after Ava's disappearance. At the time, Campfield told her that the blood was the result of a fight. It seemed that Barbara Campfield knew something, but what? Debbie had already tried speaking with her, but got nowhere. Now, Baker gave it a try. I started off by introducing myself to her, providing her my card, giving her phone numbers, and calmly explaining to her that we were now in the investigation with the DeHart family and that we were not going away, that this investigation would continue was not going to stop, and we were going to talk to everybody we could to try and find out where Ava was. Baker kept pursuing Camp Field. Realizing that Baker wasn't going to let up, she was persuaded to work out a deal. She began cooperating with Detective Bowler and the Stafford County Sheriff's Department. She directed them to an abandoned home site outside of town. Campfield told Bowler that on the night Ava disappeared, George Petsalis asked Campfield to help him dump something heavy down a well. 
He told her not to ask any questions. She never dared to. The well was pointed out to us. We subsequently uh, got a search warrant for the property, uh, went there with the assistance of the state police and the Orange County Sheriff's Office, and uh, called the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue folks to come help us actually in the excavation of the well. After making sure the conditions were safe, the fire and rescue workers were slowly lowered into the claustrophobic depths of the well. The hole was less than two feet square and 19 feet deep. Soon, the workers were hauling up buckets of soil and debris, years of accumulated leaves and dirt that concealed whatever lay below. Then the bones started coming out. They were laid on the ground beside the well so an anthropologist could see what they'd found and what was missing. It was clear the bones were human and female. Uh, we found a, a pretty much probably the best part of her whole skeleton in various pieces and forms as we brought those out. Really, they came out in uh, five-gallon bucket fulls at a time out of the well. It seemed the mystery of Ava's disappearance had been solved. But were these truly her remains? A comparison of the jaw with Ava's dental records confirmed the terrible yet reassuring truth. Debbie Dehart's sister had been found. Well, it's certainly um, better for us to have found her than to have never found her. Um, I don't think we realized how deep the wound was or how it would never heal if we hadn't found her. For the Dehart's and in the name of justice, Owsley was entrusted with determining how Ava had died. My role is, is to state what the facts are. And to do that, what you have to do is pay very careful attention to the skeleton, to the bones. And if you know how to read the bones, they, they just are, it's phenomenal what they can tell you. This, this particular skeleton of Ava DeHart, it, it tells you exactly what happened to her. And it also provides all of the, all of the clues that um, helped with the determination of her identification. Owsley studied every inch, scrutinized every fracture to try to determine the cause of death. Was she murdered elsewhere, then dumped in the well? Was she killed by the 19-foot drop? Or was she still alive, trapped, and left to die? The injuries caused by the fall were restricted to the lower half of her body. Fractures in the foot, the lower leg bones, the thigh bones, and the pelvis are the result of being dropped in the well. When she was dropped in the well, her feet hit the bottom, and that caused breakage of some of the bone. As the force goes up the shin bone, then it causes jamming at the knee joint. And in relation to this, then when you look at the distal end of the femur, these fit together like this, the force compresses into the distal end of the femur, and it causes this compression fracturing right here. From the condition of her remains, Owsley determined that Ava was probably dead before she was thrown into the well. This blow to the midface, where it actually broke four bones. It broke part of the right maxilla, the left maxilla, and both nasal bones. It just sheared the nasal bones off. And that's, that's telling you that it's coming from her right to left, but it's also going up because there's a slight oblique angle here in the nasal bones. There's no sign of a tool or any being hit with a specific type of weapon. This is something that apparently was done with a fist. There was not a part of the skeleton that didn't have some type of injury. It was, it was savage. That, that, that's, that's the only way that you, can, that you can classify it, because I think even the blow to the face would knock most people out. He was simply out to kill the girl. George Patsalis, now living in Florida, was charged with the murder of Ava Dehart. At the trial, Owsley presented Ava's remains to the jury. Through his forensic interpretation, she was able to testify against her killer. I think that Doug felt that um, the dramatic way that she died, that she would speak to the jury, that it would be Ava telling the jury 
what had ha look what happened to me. And I believe the Commonwealth's attorney used those exact words. Look what happened to me. On October 8, 1997, George Petsalis was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. The case against Patsalis was solved through forensics, detective work, and second-hand accounts. But suppose a crime had no witnesses, no crime scene, and no trace of a body. In April 1992, a 13-year-old Chevette was towed into an impoundment lot in Louisville, Kentucky. There, it joined the ranks of other abandoned vehicles, awaiting their date with the crusher. At the time, no one knew it, but this car held a terrible secret. Got it. Go, John. Everyone in New Albany, Indiana, knew that Eric Humbert and Jonathan Whitesides were the best of friends. They worked together in the U.S. Geological Survey, and they played together after work and on the weekends. So it only seemed fitting that John Whitesides was the last person to see Eric Humbert alive. On the evening of January 15, 1991, after a game of hoops with their co-workers, the two drove to the auto shop to drop Whitesides' truck off for repairs before heading home. But by 9.30 that night, Humbert still hadn't arrived at his house. Eric's wife, Missy, said she phoned Whitesides to see if he'd seen him. Whitesides told her Eric had left just a few minutes ago and assured her he'd be arriving home any minute. But the minutes turned to hours. At 2 a.m., Missy called Whitesides again. Eric still wasn't home and she was worried. Jonathan said he'd be right over. Eric never returned. Though Missy had spoken to the police the day after Eric disappeared, she didn't file an official missing persons report until two weeks later. Their relationship was becoming strained, and she thought Eric may just have wanted a little time by himself. But now she felt something terrible had happened. Eric was gone too long. He wouldn't have left his 18-month-old son. That wasn't like him. Detective Keith Whitlow of the New Albany Police led the investigation. We began interviewing co-workers. There was rumors that Eric may have had a girlfriend in another state. We checked with that person, and uh, she hadn't seen Eric. Uh, so his disappearance was pretty mysterious to everyone. Uh, not only was he gone, but also was his automobile. We had, there was, without a trace. But something of interest did come from interviewing Missy's co-workers. Many said that Jonathan frequently picked her up at work. Some claimed that Jonathan and Missy were having an affair. Suspicions centered around Jonathan Whitesides, but there was not the slightest evidence that anything illegal had happened, nothing to link him to any wrongdoing. The two may have been guilty of indiscretion, but there's no law against that. Months went by. It seemed the earth had swallowed up Eric Humbert and his car. Meanwhile, Whitesides moved in with Missy and her son. Then, in April, four months after Eric was reported missing, a white Chevette turned up in a state impoundment lot in Louisville, Kentucky. Unclaimed, it was about to be sold or scrapped. But they decided, as a matter of routine, to make one last check with the National Crime Information Center to see if this car was, in fact, stolen and whether they could have located an owner. When they did, they got a hit on the car showing that the car was part of a missing persons investigation right across the Ohio River from them in New Albany, Indiana. We were really were very, very close to losing a very key piece of the puzzle. The car belonged to Eric Humbert. It was stripped of its tags. In the hatchback were traces of blood. Hey, look at that. 
Louisville detectives interviewed Whitesides, the last person to see Humbert alive. Do you know who killed Eric Humbert? No. He consented to a polygraph exam. Do you know where Eric Humbert is? No. He failed. Did you kill Eric Humbert? No. When confronted with the results, Whitesides admitted he knew more than he let on. He told police that after the basketball game on the night Eric disappeared, the two men drove to the auto shop to drop off Whitesides' truck. Afterward, they drove to Whitesides' house to work on another car. From there, Whitesides' story took a bizarre twist. He says that suddenly uh, Eric went into a rage and uh, accused him of having an affair with his wife uh, and produced a knife and that uh, an altercation, a physical altercation between the two men developed there in the garage. Uh, during the scuffle, uh, Jonathan claimed that Eric was accidentally stabbed in the throat, a wound which, uh, according to Jonathan, proved to be fatal. Jonathan panicked. He thought nobody would believe the freak accident. He loaded the body into the back of the Chevette drove several miles to a remote spot on the Ohio River and dumped it in. He couldn't recall exactly where he unloaded it. The police were skeptical of Whiteside's tale. After his statement, he was arrested while they checked out his story. It just didn't pan out. It just didn't seem logical. Uh, we even had officers simulate um, the combat that he had described, and we found it very difficult to believe that it happened the way that he said that it did. Unless the body turned up, the only physical evidence to prove or refute Whiteside's story was the blood-stained Chevette. The stains in the hatchback were consistent with the wounded body being stashed there. But one feature stood out. The trunk liner contained an unusual pattern, five lines of blood shaped like a chevron, some blood-soaked object had been pressed against the liner, causing the marks. They were parallel, so they couldn't be impressions of fingers. The stain was notable, but meaningless, at least so far. Under the hood, investigators found a large spatter of blood. In it was a bright green fiber. No one could explain how it got there or what it meant. Inside the engine compartment appeared what looked like human tissue. It was sent off for analysis. Forensics expert Rod Englert was brought in to study the blood evidence. He found the fine mist of blood on the distributor cap wasn't consistent with a knife wound. He demonstrates. What I'm going to do is take some blood here and let's say that the end of this eyedropper is the end of a knife. And let's say that it has gone into my neck and I draw it back to maybe stab again or I just pull it out very quickly. What well, it will cause is what's called cast off and cast off is a resultant pattern that you see there. Now if you put these two together as we have here, there's a, an enormous amount of difference between those two patterns. A knife wound creates a cast off that comes from one direction but what Englert saw on the distributor cap was multi-directional. And that only comes about through gunshot. To Englert, the cloudy mist of blood clearly showed that Whitesides was lying. That's the origin of that blood. In Indiana, the pattern of bloodstains in Eric Humbert's Chevette raised doubts that he was stabbed in the throat. More doubts were raised at the forensics lab in Oregon where the tissue sample collected from the engine was studied by Ray Grimsbow. Microscopic analysis revealed the tissue was human, but it wasn't from anyone's neck. The arrangement of the cells, how the cells stained, told us that it was brain tissue. It was not um, from the skin or exfoliated tissue from some other area. This was neural tissue. We had to figure out then, how does it get out of a, a neck wound? And logically, it couldn't happen that way. A closer examination of the car revealed a single bullet hole concealed at the base of the windshield wiper. Two small fragments were recovered and sent to Grimsbow. 
he confirmed they were fragments of a bullet and its copper jacket. But most intriguing was the single tiny green fiber clinging to the bullet. He didn't know what to make of it. One thing was certain. The car was the scene of a shooting, not a stabbing. Whiteside's story wasn't washing. Seeking the truth, investigators went to the garage at the house where Jonathan Whitesides was living, the garage where he said his friend had accidentally stabbed himself to death. The crime scene was now four months old. Would anything be left? At first sight, the garage looked clean. But soon, a nine millimeter cartridge was found. Days later, a 9mm handgun was retrieved from Whiteside's work van. It seemed Eric Humbert had been shot. The brain tissue and the trajectory of the bullet indicated he was shot in the head. But something was missing. Something didn't seem right. Well, we don't have a lot of blood spatter. Normally when someone gets shot in the head, we have blood and gore everywhere. In this situation, we had very little. So when we were able to identify that tissue, then as coming from brain, basically, the spatter, the bullet fragment, all tended to fit together. This person probably was shot through the head. And the question became, how, how'd that happen without getting it everywhere? Well, the, the small green fiber. I think that's when the little light went on in my head that we have a green fiber on this bullet. Bingo, that's why we don't have the blood. He had a cap on. The weave pattern of the bloodied watch cap could also have made the chevron-shaped marks in the hatchback. The evidence so far was compelling and consistent, but was it enough to convince a jury the victim was truly Eric Humbert? All attempts to find a body met with failure. Our body turned out to be a small piece of brain matter and some blood splatters. The forensics team performed a DNA test on the blood. Problem was, they had nothing to compare it to. To go forward, they'd have to work backward. Blood relatives share similarities in their DNA. The forensics team counted on this to approximate Eric's genetic profile. To identify Eric Humberg required just a paternity test, basically. We did a family history. We had his mother, his two uh, living siblings, and his son and his wife. And so we typed them with DNA, and we took the unknown blood and the tissue from the scene, typed it. To assure that the evidence wasn't contaminated, the DNA was tested simultaneously at two separate labs. The results were consistent, but investigators were still not satisfied. The forensics team needed to get DNA from both of Humbert's parents to be sure their findings were precise and irrefutable. Permission was obtained to exhume his father, who died several years earlier. DNA was extracted from his father's leg bones. The genetic codes from Humbert's father and mother were compared to the DNA from the blood in the Chevette. We were able to show that, beyond any reasonable doubt, that this would have been consistent with uh, a son of those two people. Even without Eric Humbert's body, the prosecution had all it needed to convict Jonathan Whitesides. The prosecution alleged that on the last evening of Eric Humbert's life, he went to Jonathan Whitesides' house to help him fix his car. He may have suspected that his best friend was having an affair with his wife, but he couldn't have known how much his best friend wanted him out of the way. While Humbert leaned over his own car to show Whitesides how he'd made a similar repair in his Chevette, Whitesides pulled out a 9mm pistol and shot his friend execution style at point-blank range. He then loaded the body into the back of the car, disposed of it, and abandoned the vehicle. He thought that by eliminating the body, he'd eliminated all the evidence. He was wrong. Whenever a criminal enters or leaves a crime scene, he always leaves something there. He always takes something with him. 
and I, I think that's very, very true. It's just today we are much more capable of finding those things that they take and leave than maybe we were just 10 years ago. The jury deliberated only 45 minutes before finding Jonathan Whitesides guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. As for Eric Humbert, so far his body hasn't been found. Eric's mother told me after Jonathan was sentenced, she grabbed me by the arm and she said, please don't quit looking for him. And uh, it's kind of ironic, every time uh, we get information about a body found locally or something, it's like nobody has to say it, everybody goes, you know, I wonder if that's Eric. And, uh, and not as of yet, it hadn't been, but you know, we're still, we're still in some way, we're still looking. Not too long ago, when victims went missing, killers went free. Today, the rules are changing. The laws of justice have allied with the laws of science. And even if the victim can't be found, chances are the killer will be. In Seattle, police hope a bloody handprint will finger a killer. But the stain is barely visible. Can investigators bring the evidence into focus? A new computer promises to read a killer's mind. Can it really see the truth locked in the murderer's memory? Two bodies are found in the California wilds. Clues are spotty and scarce. To bring the killer to light, police rely on a new laser technique. When evidence can't be seen with the naked eye, investigators must use extraordinary means to find it. As technology develops to tease out clues, it's providing detectives with an infallible witness. Forensic science is constantly evolving, from the discovery of the uniqueness of the human fingerprint to the ability to match a criminal to his crime through DNA profiling. Technology continues to provide investigators with new weapons. But fingerprint and DNA evidence are discovered in only 1% of all cases. When trusted techniques fail, Investigators must turn to cutting-edge technology to bring invisible clues to light. On the clear spring morning of May 14, 1995, in Kirkland, Washington, just outside Seattle, Randy Acall returned from work and noticed that his neighbor's front door was propped open. Ordinarily, he wouldn't there? have given it much thought. Hello? But he had noticed that the door had been open when he had left for work the Hello? night before. Anybody home? Randy was a little worried and decided to see if everything was all right. Hello? Hello? As he entered the bedroom, a gruesome sight greeted his eyes. He found the body of a woman in her oh 30s God. lying in a heap at the foot of the bed. Her head was covered in the top bed sheet, and a t-shirt was bunched up around her neck. Blood stained the carpet beneath her. Horrified, Randy dialed 911. Uh, yes, I'd like to report an emergency. Detective T.J. Klump of the Kirkland Police responded to the call. It was Mother's Day, 1995, at about 10.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I was preparing to take my wife and daughter out for Mother's Day, when just prior to leaving, uh, I received a call from the Kirkland Dispatch Center. 
and they requested that I immediately contact Sergeant Markle and the detective division that there had been a suspicious death that uh, all the detectives were being called in for to investigate. When the police reached the apartment, they saw no sign of forced entry. At first glance, there were none of the usual indications that a crime had taken place. The TV, the stereo, and other items of value were still in the condominium. Nothing had been disturbed. Once I arrived there and after we had obtained the search warrant, we entered the condominium. And the first thing that struck me was how clean it was for a crime scene. Uh, it was very clean, immaculate. The killer seemed to have been meticulous in covering his tracks. Detectives set about trying to uncover what few clues they could. The case hinged on their ability to bring secrets of the crime scene out into the light. A driver's license was found in a denim purse. The murdered woman was identified as Dawn Faring, a student at the Lutheran Bible Institute who had been living at the condominium for several months. Autopsy evidence, including the body's temperature and its state of rigor mortis, indicated that she had been killed within the last 24 hours. Further test results indicated that the victim had been sexually assaulted, but none of the culprit's DNA was found. The detective and his fellow officers carefully collected evidence from the scene, removing the bed sheets and sections of the blood-stained carpet. They hoped these might contain some clue to the killer's identity. They also found cigarette tobacco and ash near the bed. The victim didn't smoke. They were left by the killer, but were of little use. Another scrap turned up that proved more valuable. While we were searching the condominium for evidence, we found a box of receipts. And Don Farring was a very meticulous person. Uh, she was very organized. She saved receipts. She had phone logs. She, uh, and she had saved some receipts, one of which was a receipt from 512 of 95. Uh, it was during the late evening hour. She had purchased some groceries at a nearby Fred Meyer store. To pinpoint Farring's time of death, and to determine whom she might have been with, police went to the grocery store listed on the receipt. A clerk remembered helping the victim. Faring had come in near closing time. She had been friendly and in a good mood, and she had left the store by herself. Along with this information and the evidence gathered from the crime scene, investigators began to piece together the victim's final hours. After leaving the store just before 10 p.m. on May 12th, she apparently went straight home and unpacked her groceries. Putting herself through Bible school, Faring kept track of every penny she spent. She placed her receipt in the box in her hall closet. She then began to bake a pan of brownies, possibly for a Mother's Day celebration the next afternoon. Police estimated it took her an hour to make the brownies. They found them cut and arranged on a plate by the stove. By retracing Faring's steps, investigators arrived at an estimated time of death. Pinning down the time of death narrowed the killer's yeah. window of opportunity. Yeah. But who killed Who's Dawn Faring? Careful scrutiny of the crime scene revealed the faint traces of what might have been finger and palm prints on the bed sheets, traces of the murderer preserved in the victim's own blood. 
but there was no way to dust or lift the prints from the sheet. Detectives needed to somehow make them clear enough to be useful. The evidence was passed on to King County latent laboratory scientist Pat Warwick. When we opened up the evidence, um, we could tell there was some kind of body fluid on the sheet, but uh, any discernible detail, any kind of handprint or anything was very, very difficult. The print was smeared and faint. No one had ever tried to lift a fingerprint from cloth before, and this one promised to be particularly difficult. Warwick believed his best hope might be to process the prints with amido black, a forensic dye that highlights organic proteins such as blood. But amido black was usually used on hard, non-porous surfaces. Its use on fabric could jeopardize this crucial piece of evidence. Warwick called the FBI for help. But they could offer no advice beyond agreeing that Amido Black was the best approach. If Warwick used Amido Black on the sheet fragment, the dye and the rinses in distilled water might well destroy the print. But if the process worked, Warwick would be breaking fresh ground in forensic analysis. Warwick was extremely careful, but it seemed he was not careful enough. When he immersed the fabric in the inky solution, his worst fears were realized. The entire swatch, palm print and all, turned an opaque shade of dark purple. Any hope of getting a legible print seemed lost. In Seattle, authorities investigating the murder of Dawn Faring feared that the only forensic evidence, a palm print, was ruined. Hoping to find another lead, detectives questioned the victim's neighbors. Was this a crime of opportunity? Or was the killer someone Dawn Faring knew and trusted enough to let in her door? While the work of the detectives moved forward, there was a glimmer of hope in Pat Warwick's laboratory. He was relieved to see the excess dye begin to rinse away from the palm print. As he hoped, the amido black dyed the blood stains purple. But it also stained the fabric light blue, making it difficult to discern the palm print from the weave of the fabric. The confusion of the two patterns made a clear analysis next to impossible. Warwick contacted his colleague, Eric Berg, an expert in the field of digital imaging and enhancement at the Tacoma Police Department. Could Berg's computers and high-tech cameras read the bloody palm print and identify the killer? Berg used a digital camera to capture the print. It gave him the flexibility he needed to manipulate and clarify the image. Once he obtained the digital images of the bloody print, he followed strict chain of evidence procedures. The images were tracked with a system that protected them from tampering or accidental alteration. The software that we use uses the data encryption standard, which is a governmental standard that actually will, will allow you to mathematically prove that, that an image or any kind of a digital file has not been altered. To preserve the original picture, he made copies to work from. 
Now he was ready to clean up the print. But the image was still in such poor condition, he was not confident he could do much. The ridges of the fingerprint seemed hopelessly tangled with the fabric weave. Now, at this point, I would put in the source. You could just start to follow a ridge line on the print, and then all of a sudden the weave pattern would come in and, and disrupt your eye, and you'd, you'd go off on a, on a tangent. And you couldn't follow that ridge without constantly being interrupted by the fabric pattern. So the biggest problem was that fabric pattern. We had to find a way to just suppress it or get rid of it somehow, and then look at the print, what was left after that. And if I move my box over here, Berg used software to filter out the background pattern. While it didn't entirely remove the weave pattern, it managed to blur it, allowing the ridge detail to stand out in clearer relief. But it seemed to Berg that while every step made the image of the bloody print a little clearer, it also created new problems for him to solve. In blurring the fabric pattern, this process significantly reduced the contrast of the image. It remained to be seen whether he could make sense of the print. So you left work While Eric that, Berg struggled right. to render a clear print, so the Kirkland detectives continued to bit. question the victim's neighbors. The names of five and men I living near the victim's the condominium the complex mm -hmm. came up with prior uh, arrest and fingerprint records. One of these men was Eric Hayden, who lived in the apartment above the victims. When Hayden drove into the condominium parking lot, the detectives were waiting to speak with him. Well, let's, let's wait until he uh, I looked over at the driver, uh, who was a white male in his late 20s, and I noticed that he was smoking a cigarette, and he was looking over at us with his eyes, but yet his head remained facing straight ahead. Um, I thought this was kind of suspicious. Hayden strolled past the officers without acknowledging them and disappeared into his condominium. We waited a few minutes and we wanted to see if he would return outside, which he did. Uh, he walked back down the stairs and again walked past us, not looking over at us, and was walking directly towards his car. Uh, it was at that time I approached him and I said, excuse me, are you Eric Hayden? And he said, yes, I am. And I asked him uh, if I could ask him a few questions about that night, to which he agreed. Hayden claimed he'd been out drinking on the night of the murder and knew nothing about it. He had noticed nothing unusual when he came home. He puffed on a cigarette as the conversation began. To the detectives, he seemed nervous. But a case of nerves would never be enough for a conviction if Hayden was the killer. The police still needed solid evidence, and pressure remained heavy on Eric Berg to provide it. In his lab, he fed the image of the bloody palm print through yet another computer program. This step raised the tonal values of the ridge detail, much like adjusting the contrast on a television screen. Finally, using all his software and expertise, he produced an image clear enough for comparison with the prints of any suspects. Police asked Warwick to check the prints of the five men with criminal records who lived near the condo complex. And that included the prints of Eric Hayden. They gave us the name of Eric Hayden, and we checked our file, and we had some prints of his on file in our agency. So we pulled those for comparison. Well, once you're looking at the comparison, and you're making the positive opinion of a match, as a late examiner, there's that short period of time when you're the only one who knows. You know, the detectives don't know, no one knows. And then so it gives you a real sense of accomplishment. On May 31st, Pat Warwick called the detectives and told them he had made a positive match. The prints on the bedsheet did indeed match the prints of Eric Hayden. That same night, the Kirkland detectives went to Hayden's condominium Who's to there? execute a search Police warrant. Officers, open the door. Eric Hayden, we have a warrant for your arrest. Lay down, face down on the deck. Going for Hayden was handcuffed and arrested. What's going on? Man, 
His apartment was searched top to bottom, and his girlfriend was questioned. He was charged with first-degree murder. After Hayden's arrest, police began to piece together a picture of the gruesome events of May 12, 1995. They speculated that Eric Hayden had gained entry to the victim's home, probably through some false pretense. A brutal assault and murder followed shortly thereafter. At some point, Hayden lingered over his victim, enjoying a cigarette. He placed it on the night table and covered the victim with a sheet. He then wiped his bloody hands on the sheet. As he left the scene, one of the victim's slippers jammed in the door, propping it open. It had been the open door that first attracted attention to the crime scene. Though the suspect was in custody and evidence strongly linked him to the crime, Detective Klomp's case was not airtight. Hayden's lawyers asserted that the digital technology was too new to be relied upon at the trial. They argued that the enhanced images might have been altered or tampered with. Any new forensic technology undergoes intense legal and scientific scrutiny. Hundreds of cases have been lost through improper evidence handling procedures. At the heart of the defense team's argument, was their view that a virtual image might falsely incriminate a very real and innocent man. Some amino black on it. Had Hayden's right attorneys been successful be in this challenge, there. losing those Take prints as evidence would have seriously damaged the prosecution's case. But Eric Berg took extra care to explain the process to the members of the jury and to let them decide for themselves. We took this into court, we took the equipment with us, we set it up, we took the sheet that we originally received from King County, and we actually captured the image in court, brought it into the computer, performed all of the steps that we had done, and printed out the image. And we were able to show the jury that everything we did there is the same as what we did before, and the result is the same, and it's repeatable. Satisfied that Berg's digital enhancement techniques were sound, credible, repeatable, and damning, the jury needed only three hours to return their verdict guilty of murder in the first degree. This technology was, was incredible. It helped us solve the case much faster than we would have been able to, having just gone out and contacting people or waiting for additional information to come in. This uh, left no doubt in anyone's mind that this was the killer. It positively identified the killer. Those prints, which had seemed to be just smudges at first, had finally yielded their secrets to the new digital imaging technology. Ultimately, they betrayed Eric Hayden to justice. Hayden left behind his handprint, thinking it was an illegible smudge. He didn't know that computer enhancement could turn that faint residue into a clear picture of guilt. Other criminals take greater pains to conceal the traces of their crimes, but the remnants of murder aren't so easy to hide. Forensics has ways of flushing them out. On a frigid January morning in 1987, a fur trapper was checking his traps in the blizzard-bound Cactus Flats region of California's Big Bear. It was hard going in such miserable weather. At about 11 that morning, he noticed a large oblong object covered in the new blanket of snow. There in the wilderness lay an abandoned mattress. The strange find seemed innocuous enough, but as the trapper checked around it, he made a macabre discovery. He hurried to the nearest telephone and summoned the police.
Homicide Sergeant Gary Stroop of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department responded to the call. When we got there, uh, it was just starting to snow again, and it's probably about 18 degrees. Uh, so we were trying to do the scene as fast as we could so we could get out of there before we got, got stranded. Beneath the mattress lay two bodies, a man and a woman, both murdered. Stroop found that in one way, the weather had worked in his favor. The cold had protected the bodies against decomposition. He was also fortunate to find the bodies intact. Check down there, see if there's anything. There's a lot of animal activity up there. There's bears, mountain lions, coyotes, you know, you name it. Had the weather been uh, warmer, we probably would have had animal activity on the bodies. Anything, footprints, anything? But who were the victims? Who had taken their lives? I'll tell you one thing. The only clues at the scene were the victims and the mattress. The man had some distinctive tattoos that resembled the kind worn by convicts. I see blood down there. The detectives tried to identify him by checking prison records. Homicide Sergeant Stroop. Sergeant Stroop's yeah, hunch about the tattoos yeah, paid no, off. No problem, the fingerprints taken from the man matched those of an ex-convict named Richard Crisson. Yeah. The woman was identified as his girlfriend, Shanna uh, Thole. Yeah, no, I just... Autopsy evidence showed that both victims had died of multiple shotgun blasts. Through prison records, detectives were able to locate and question Richard Crisson's family. Crisson's brother told police that Richard and Shanna had gone to Victorville to see a man by the name of Archie Woods. According to the brother, Crisson dealt drugs for Woods, who was a motorcycle gang member. This information, along with a background check of Woods, made him the detective's prime suspect. The police paid a visit to Archie Woods. His house lay in a secluded area 20 miles from where the victims were found. Woods wasn't at home. The detectives were greeted by Archie's girlfriend, Sherry Mills. She told the officer she didn't know where he was, but reluctantly agreed to let them in. Even before they entered Archie Woods' home, a possible clue caught their eye. On the front porch, beside the door, they found two spots that appeared to be blood. The stains could have been nothing, or they could have been the clue that would break the case wide open. It was too soon to tell. The detectives hoped to find the answer inside. Police investigating the deaths of Richard Crisson and Shanna Thole chased the only lead they had. At the home of drug dealer Archie Woods, they sought any clues they could find. The detectives informed Woods' girlfriend, Sherry Mills, that they were told Shanna and Richard had visited the house. Mills admitted that Crisson and Thole had indeed been there, but only to spend the night on their way somewhere else. She had no idea of their destination. Well, it was our friend Rich and... Um... Inside the house, detectives saw more brown spots that resembled blood. The house smelled of fresh paint. In the back bedroom, they found several paint cans. There was no sign of a mattress. If the murders occurred in this bedroom, police suspected that the paint covered crucial evidence. Police needed a way to see beneath it to look for evidence of a murder. It was the only way they could connect the homicides to this potential crime scene. They ordered a search warrant and then notified the crime scene unit that they had a difficult problem to solve. In the yard, officers noticed several wide, low-profile tire tracks 
consistent with those made by a sports car. The woman victim, Shanna Thold, was last seen driving her high-performance sports car. The obvious bloodstains were examined and the visible evidence was collected. Even so, the police were stymied. If the blood found at the house matched Thole and Christens, it could be explained as coming from a fist fight. There was not enough blood in plain sight to prove murder with a shotgun. It seemed as though the entire investigation had literally hit a wall. Forensic expert David Stockwell of the Sheriff's Scientific Investigation Division thought an alternative light source might reveal evidence hidden behind the paint in Wood's house. The alternate light source, or ALS, is a variable intensity laser beam typically used to highlight body fluid evidence on clothing or at a crime scene. Various fluids reflect specific frequencies of light. By adjusting the frequency of the laser, invisible evidence can be seen. Forensic technicians use tinted goggles and reflection enhancing chemicals to make trace body fluids glow under the laser beam. Here, simulated bloody footprints become too faint to see with the naked eye. But with the right chemicals sprayed on them, and with the laser of the ALS set at the proper frequency, they fluoresce. In theory, at least, blood evidence could be made to glow, even from behind a coat of paint. But it would take the precise combination of chemicals, goggle tints, and laser frequencies to penetrate the painted layer. The ALS is very good at picking up certain biological fluids, such as semen, but is not typically used to find blood because blood in itself is usually visible to the naked eye. What we were doing with the ALS was to see through that opaque layer of paint to see underneath it and what was there. But would it work in such an unorthodox application at the home of Archie Woods? Police in San Bernardino had never used an ALS in this manner before. It was not built to illuminate an entire wall. They had to slowly comb small areas hoping that the light could see through the paint and reveal any evidence beneath. Okay, Richard, take your off. Little by little, they succeeded. With the ALS, the grim events at the Woods house were brought to light. There on the wall, beneath the fresh paint, was a wide splash pattern of darkened blood that had been all but invisible to the naked eye. This was the breakthrough police hoped for. They could now read the stain patterns on the wall to determine what happened. As shown here with this colored fluid, blood shed in violence can behave in several ways. It can drip, making a circular spot. Its diameter depends on how far and how much of the blood has fallen. It can form a series of streaks when flung off an object, such as a knife slashing through the air. This is called casting off. But another equally telling kind of blood stain appeared on Archie Wood's wall. The largest of all blood stains that I've ever seen at crime scenes are produced by what is called arterial spurting. And in this case, what I was seeing underneath the paint on the wall was in fact the bloodstain size consistent with arterial spurting. The spurting patterns on the wall were consistent with the location of the wounds found on Crisson and Thole. The ALS painted a grim picture of their violent death. The next problem was how to preserve the bloodstains for use as evidence in court. Without proof positive of arterial spurting, a shrewd defense team might claim that only a fist fight had taken place in that room, not a murder, and certainly not two murders. 
The ALS had illuminated the evidence bit by bit, but now the laser had to shine on the entire wall in order to take a photograph. Hey, George, look around. Uh, Richard, I'm going to call you George. Investigators oh, used Richard, a technique though. called painting with light. Yeah. While the camera shutter was held open, the ALS was shown on the wall from left to right and top to bottom until the entire wall had been recorded through the course of several minutes. When the negatives were developed, they provided a clear, admissible picture of what the ALS revealed. That was good news for Sergeant Stroop. With the pattern that we had uh, on that wall, with the use of the laser, it was obvious it was high velocity and a large amount of it, uh, much more so than you know, you'd ever have gotten from somebody with a bloody nose or uh, getting beat up. The evidence of violent death in that fateful room was mounting. The exposed blood patterns revealed that at the time they were shot, Shanna Thole and Richard Crisson were lying in the bed, presenting no potential threat to their assailant. Meanwhile, their alleged killer was still at large. That's, yeah, that's what I was saying. OK. All right. In San Bernardino, the search for Archie Woods, suspected of killing Richard Crisson and Shanna Thole, took on new urgency. To avoid being implicated in the killings, Woods' girlfriend cooperated with authorities. Um, no, he, um, he left a little bit later. Um, she disclosed to the to detectives to that Archie was in Modesto, visiting his little girl on her birthday. Uh, so Richard and Sean were already gone by the time he... On Friday, the day Detective Stroop was gathering evidence at Archie's home, Archie himself was already under arrest in a neighboring county for carrying a concealed weapon in his car. He was driving a sports car at the time. Shanna Thole's sports car. From his cell in the San Bernardino jail, Woods maintained his innocence in the double homicide. He claimed that the murders were committed by members of his motorcycle gang. According to Woods, on the night of the murder, gang members asked Woods to lure Richard Crisson to his home. Woods claimed that after Crisson and Thole had arrived, he left his house as the gang instructed. Woods refused to identify the gang members involved. Archie uh, stuck with his story that he did not know who the other people were that had come into the house, that they were alive when he left and dead when he came back. But he would not ever give up the names of the other individuals that were involved. Archie Woods said that he had then panicked and dumped the bodies in Big Bear. But with the help of the ALS, the police discovered the crucial piece of trace blood evidence that shot holes in Archie's story. The reclined position of the victims, as indicated by the blood stains on the wall, just didn't add up to a violent confrontation. Detectives pieced together a likely scenario for the events of that night. Crisson and Thole had come to Archie's home to settle a dispute over a drug deal gone wrong. There was a long night of discussion and argument. Apparently, the disagreement was not resolved to Archie's satisfaction. But he let Crisson and Thole think an accord had been reached. The couple went to bed, unaware of the heavy price that Archie planned to exact from them that night. Police believe that when he thought they were sound asleep, Wood struck his helpless victims, taking their lives with blast after blast from a shotgun. One true statement was that he had dumped the bodies and the blood-soaked bedding in Big Bear, thinking no one would ever find them. Back at his house, he had first tried to clean the wall, but the blood wouldn't come off. He then covered the evidence with a thick coat of paint. 
but the alternate light source defied his efforts to conceal his crime. It clearly showed the pattern of the bloodstains through the opaque coat. Uh, you know, when looking at that, there's no doubt in my mind they were killed here, they were in this bed, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> that's going to show everybody, you know, what we know or help us prove what we know or convince a jury of what we know, and it did. Archie Woods was given two life sentences for the double murder of Richard Crisson and Shanna Thole. Every criminal leaves evidence behind. The key is to know how to find it. But the most compelling evidence is also the least tangible. It's the criminal's knowledge of his actions. A new technique is testing a way of tapping the suspect's mind to turn a criminal's own memory against him. Larry Farwell is the director and chief scientist of the Human Brain Research Laboratory in Fairfield, Iowa. He has developed a new computerized system known as brain fingerprinting. It reads the memory centers of the human brain. He believes that brain fingerprinting will one day be used to positively link perpetrators to their crimes. Brain fingerprinting is a scientific method of determining whether certain information is stored in a brain or is not stored in the brain. If an individual has committed a crime, he'll have certain information relevant to that crime stored in his brain. So we can use brain fingerprinting to determine scientifically whether he committed the crime or not. When someone commits a crime, his brain records it as a memory. Brain fingerprinting seeks to reveal that memory by showing the suspect evidence taken from the crime scene. Now I'm going to be putting this headband on your head. A headband with sensors is placed on the subject. A series of pictures or words is flashed on the screen. The computer records the brain waves produced in response to what the subject sees. The responses are recorded as a waveform. By analyzing the pattern of waves, Farwell can determine if the subject is recognizing what he's seeing. So when you have a situation where a crime is committed, there are certain details about the crime that only the criminal would know, then you can detest, does this brain have those details stored in it? If so, then the individual committed the crime. If not, then not. The FBI is at the forefront of developing and evaluating new technology. After hearing of Farwell's system, they put it to the test. The FBI tested brain fingerprinting on their own agents at the Bureau's training facility at Quantico, Virginia. We conducted a study on FBI agents, and the purpose of this study was to see if we could determine whether an individual is an FBI agent or not based on his or her brain waves. If we can determine an FBI agent, then we could determine whether somebody is an agent of some, say, foreign intelligence organization or a, a, a criminal group, just based on their brain responses. Each subject was presented with a series of words on a computer screen. Many were FBI acronyms or terms familiar only to agents. The FBI agents were specifically told to do everything they could to conceal from Farwell that they were in any way connected with the Bureau. The participant's brain response to each stimulus was measured by electrodes on a headband. The electrodes were wired to the brainwave analysis software of Farwell's system. So what we did is to present stimuli, phrases, that only an FBI agent, because of their training, would know, mixed in with others. The FBI agents recognized them, we picked up the brain responses, we knew that they were FBI agents. The principle behind the brain fingerprinting system is very simple. 
Farwell has discovered that the memory centers of the human brain respond to the sight of familiar stimuli with the distinct change in electrical activity. He calls this change a murmur. And that is the specific brain response that we measure, that we analyze with a computer, in order to determine whether an individual recognizes the words or pictures that we flashed on the screen that are relevant to the crime or to whatever it is that we're investigating. When the subject sees anything on the screen, it creates a pattern of brain activity. A murmur is increased brain activity produced when the subject recognizes what he's seeing. This headband will measure the electrical brain The signals. test participants who did not work for the FBI did not recognize the specific FBI stimuli, so no murmurs were detected. Some of them relevant to the FBI and some of them not. Researchers with the United States Navy also heard the claims made about the system. They devised a test of their own to see if brain fingerprinting could distinguish military medical students from civilians. They used a list of acronyms specific to medicine and the military. Lieutenant Commander Rene Hernandez conducted the test. The test was 100 percent accurate. They were able to tell each and every one. The trick with this is not so much if the technique it wor works properly. The trick is if you ask the right questions. Because if they had not come up with a group of really good acronyms that only the students would know, then they wouldn't be able to determine the difference between the medical students and the staff, for example. So the trick is in being clever enough to ask the correct questions, because the brain will always answer it honestly. Careful preparation of the words or pictures for a session is vital for accurate, useful results. The questions must be phrased in such a way that when a murmur occurs, it is clear why. In a murder investigation, both a witness to a shooting and the shooter might show a murmur when confronted with the murder weapon. You have two people, only one person actually committed the crime. You have another person who simply saw it. They have the same information in their brain, so you have to get that, you have to ask the questions properly. Rigorously constructed lab tests are one thing, but how would the brain fingerprinting system work on the front lines of a murder investigation? Could Dr. Farwell's computer read the mind of an actual killer? Like a page torn from a science fiction novel, brain fingerprinting might be the next century's most powerful new forensic tool. No criminal secrets would be safe when his own brain waves could bring him to justice. Captain Blaine Coral, commander of the Investigations sure. Division of the Alexandria, Virginia Police, has also today. tested the system. The Though he was initially skeptical about its use in the real world, he was quickly won over. Sure. The vision I had was uh, like of the Three Stooges with a, with a salad bowl sitting on the top of someone's head with wires coming out of it. Uh, and I thought, not only would this technique or this, this uh, technology never really be useful, but there's no way in the world it would ever be accepted by the law enforcement community. Coral compared brain fingerprinting with the polygraph, the lie detector used by law enforcement for many years. The polygraph is still not admissible in court, but has become a standard tool to guide police. The polygraph works on the theory that you can't control your heart rate or uh, something called your galvanic skin response or your breathing patterns. Uh, the brain fingerprinting sort of takes that a step further and recognizes the fact that you can't control the electrical activity in your brain. A polygraph registers only stress or emotional responses, such as heart and respiration rates and sweating. By analyzing the readings, the operator tries to discern whether a subject is being truthful or deceptive in his answers. But in some cases, the polygraph can be fooled. Brain fingerprinting is often more general. 
It can identify the presence of hidden information in persons fraudulently claiming either knowledge or ignorance of certain facts. But again, it reveals only the presence of the information, not the details. So they're going to uh, both help us toward the same end, which is ultimately to find out the truth about what we're investigating and formulate the best case for presentation in court, but they're going to sort of attack it from different angles. Both can be very crucial to a successful case. Serious questions remain about the wholesale application of Dr. Farwell's invention. Would a murmur be revealed if a killer were in a drunken blackout or a psychotic state when he took his victim's life? In such cases, there might not be a brain fingerprint after the fact. What if right after he committed the crime, the killer received a severe head trauma? But that's what actually happened with the, um, the, the, the person who was the bodyguard who was in the car with Princess Diana. Everybody thinks he's trying to cover up something. He had such a severe traumatic injury, he probably will never remember that because the brain never was healthy enough to store that information to long-term memory. In most cases, brain fingerprinting a witness or an accomplice can reveal knowledge of all kinds of crime from espionage to terrorist plots. At least that's the promise of this technology. Brain fingerprinting is not yet admissible in the United States, but it might be only a matter of time before it becomes a routine tool. The relatively new technique of DNA profiling is known to be so dead on accurate that genetic evidence is readily accepted. Ultimately, scientists and criminal investigators agree that brain fingerprinting shows great potential in murder investigations. In a shooting death with no witnesses, the killer would be the only person with intimate knowledge of the crime. With Dr. Farwell's computer, the murderer's own brain could become a witness for the prosecution. Technology is providing new ways to reveal evidence that would have been lost or unavailable just a few years ago. Today, investigators can peer beneath paint, lift a smudged palm print from a bedsheet, and perhaps even tap into a suspect's memory to find the truth. There may be no way to completely stop crime but forensic science is finding ever more ingenious tactics to catch criminals.